Hi, my name is Matt Holliday and welcome back to my class on Programming in Go. I've spent some time talking about the Go programming language and now I'm going to move into some other topics, all right, primarily around tools like benchmarking and profiling and testing. Before I do that, I want to get into the subject of mechanical sympathy. Now that's a term that was actually taken from race car driving. Okay, it goes back a while, but more recently we had this movie Ford versus Ferrari, right? And we had the notion that the person who actually works on the car and understands how the car works is better able to drive it and get more out of the car. And it's the same sort of thing for programming. All right, if we have an understanding of how to work with the machine, we can write programs that are faster and more efficient. I'm going to start with this quote by Henry Podoroski. But to illustrate it, I want to refer to this machine down here in the lower right-hand corner. It's a next box. It's what Steve Jobs did when he first left Apple 30-something years ago. All right, And about 30 years ago, when I was a grad student, we had one of these. And it was a perfectly usable machine, even though it had about 100 times less of everything you think of in terms of hardware, like CPU performance or memory or disk space. And so the quote is about how even though the hardware makers keep making faster hardware, we keep making software that's even slower. Now, I will put one little asterisk next to this. And I'll, I'll talk about this machine in the context of not doing digital media. We did not try to do digital video and movies with it or digital music. All right. And so, yes, modern machines are going to have a lot of DSP capability to do that kind of stuff that this machine didn't. But if you think about the other workloads, Okay, it was a perfectly usable machine. Now, you know, Go, we typically talk about building things in the cloud. So I want to have a disclaimer, because when we build in the cloud, we've already decided to give up some amount of performance. There's an overhead to putting things in the cloud. Okay, if we wanted the absolute fastest performance, of course, we would build this thing on this giant computer, and maybe we'd build it in assembly language or something. Oh, well, we don't do that anymore. That was the mainframe days. Okay, but we've made some trade-offs. The trade-offs about the architecture, like using microservices, and the trade-offs of, you know, there's overhead in communication, okay, and the cost of development, as well as the cost of actually operating it. And one of the things we want to keep in perspective is, yes, we want our code to perform, but we want to be able to read it and maintain it. Okay, that's also an important value. And that's an engineering trade-off that we have to make. When we think about optimizing, we should think about it top-down. Because the biggest bang for the buck is going to come at the top, right? The architecture we choose. And then there's design issues, okay, about what algorithms or are we concurrent, and maybe how many layers of abstraction do we throw into the picture. And then we get down to implementation, where we look at things like the programming language and how we use memory. Now, mechanical sympathy is about the implementation level of things. That's what we're going to be talking about in this talk. I do want to throw out one item here, and I'll just I'll do it now. Okay? It's hard to do mechanical sympathy with an interpreted language because they're designed to abstract the machine away from you so you can't even see it. And the abstraction is expensive. So we typically see much worse performance with an interpreted language in the cloud. Okay? In some cases, maybe an order of magnitude compared to a compiled language. All right. So what I'm talking about really only applies to compiled languages. And again, I'm going to be doing it in the context of Go. Now, the chart I'm showing here, we've already seen. I talked about this at the very beginning, about why use Go. Okay. And I drew a line right around 2005, and I said that line represented an inflection point. The world changed. Okay. The processors stopped getting faster. Okay. The performance is not quite leveled off because they're small compiler improvements, but what we did get was an increase in the number of cores. Right? And that's just, you know, it's about the limitations of hardware. So in one sense, Moore's Law hasn't stopped in terms of we, we keep having more transistors, but we couldn't do the thing where the chip got twice as fast from a clock speed per perspective every 18 months. Right? There's another thing going on here, so I'm going to take a little piece of this chart and add another line to it, and that is to consider the gap between the performance of the CPU and memory. Okay, 
we keep me making the CPUs faster at a very high rate of acceleration. But we can't do that with memory. Now, there's different reasons for this. Some of it has to do with the memory chips. But I want to give you another example really quick. You know, imagine if I have a CPU and I have some memory banks, right? You know, in most computers, you have this motherboard. And you have a chip on the motherboard and you have some memory on the motherboard. And there's a distance between here, this distance D. Okay? Well, it didn't really change, and the speed of light didn't really change. So if you think about making the clock cycle one half of what it was, then the time to send signals up and down this wire is 2x in terms of clock cycles. All right? Now, that's not the only explanation, but that's part of it. Okay? We can't overcome physics. All right? So we've had this reality that since the early 80s, there's been this ever-growing gap between the CPU and the memory. And what that means is, if it takes a cycle to do an addition, well, maybe it takes 20 cycles or 40 cycles or 100 cycles or more to go out to memory to read a value from memory into the, the chip so we can actually do the addition. Okay, right? The memory read stops the chip from processing until we get the memory. Now, there are solutions to that that involve out-of-order loads and stores and so on. That helps some, okay? But we have to deal with this reality. The chip isn't getting faster. The, the gap between the CPU and memory isn't going to shrink. We're never going back to the 80s, okay? And unfortunately, software just keeps sucking up performance faster than the hardware makers can make it. And by the way, we also have to deal with the fact that it costs a lot to write software compared to hardware. I used to think the trade-off happened around 1970. It looks like it happened in the early 50s. All right? Now, I'm going to throw in one more chart. It's a little bit um, facetious, you know, not to scale. Okay? But you know, ever since, say, the mid-90s, we've had this problem of the bloat of software growing. And that's the other thing we got to deal with. The software gets bloated, and it just keeps on eating up CPU capacity. All right? Some of that is due to features. Remember the talking paperclip. And we have lots of other things, lots of animations and so on. But some of it has to do with the way the software is written. Okay? It's being written ever since the mid-90s in an inefficient way, and that includes the use of interpreted languages, which have a built-in inefficiency based on abstracting away the machine. So mechanical sympathy is about getting into this reality of you know, making software and making it reasonably perform reasonably well. All right. And you know, we can make it simpler, that always helps. All right. But more importantly, and this is what mechanical sympathy is actually about, is making the software work with the machine and not against it. All right. And so I said originally when I came back to this diagram, right, we had a couple choices. We could make the software concurrent because we have more cores. And that is, in a sense, also a type of mechanical sympathy. But the other choice was we can make the software suck less. Okay. And that's where we're going to go in this presentation. Now, to do that, we have to drill down a little bit. Okay. Because, again, this thing about the memory in the CPU is a big driver. So let's just take a little quick look at some hardware architecture. This is sort of a generic x86 design, right? And, you know, this is like four cores. So this little thingy right here is the actual core that does calculations. And that's the only place calculations happen. They happen in the core. And we have a design with multiple levels of cache, right, where, say, the level three cache is shared, and the level one and two are per core, right? That has an impact on our design. And these numbers down here are relative to a clock cycle. And again, they're, they're, they're probably not exact for any particular model of chip, but they're illustrative. Okay? When we go off the core to the level 1 and 2 cache, which are tied to that core, we're already looking at an order of magnitude latency to get the memory. If we go out to level 3 core or main memory, two orders of magnitude. And then, of course, we have enormous amounts of space out here in the world of SSDs in the network. And it takes a long, long time to get out there. So it's expensive in terms of the latency, the wait, the wait time. And again, we get around that some by having, you know, the CPU tries to reorder some loads and start them early. 
so that the results are available a little sooner. <coughs> okay, there's a limit to that. So the reality is that the cost of doing computational work is really driven by the cost of reading memory. How long does it take? Those latencies of fetching from memory have a real impact. And the answer to that, of course, was the cache that we just looked at, right? By adding in cache, you know, because if you go back to 1980, we didn't have cache in little computers. That wasn't a thing. It wasn't needed. Okay. So the cache attempts to use patterns of access that we'll talk about in a second to make it better, to make that cost, that the effect of that latency less visible. It does impose a couple of limits. The first is that normally we have to fetch data in units of a cache line. And most of these architectures now, that's a 64-byte chunk. So that's actually the unit of reading main memory. We don't go out and read a byte from main memory. We read 64 bytes, and we bring that into level 3 cache, and then 64 bytes comes down to level 2 cache, and then it comes down to level 1 cache. And yes, it sounds like it takes a long time, and it does. And then eventually the CPU can get a byte or a word out of level 1 cache. Okay. The other thing that's going on is there, because we now have multiple cores, right, like this 4-core design, and they have their own copies of level 1 and level 2, synchronization is required. Okay, cache lines can also have a type of race condition. Now, that race condition is managed in the hardware. It's invisible to your program in all but one case I'll talk about. Okay, you don't need to manage it. You just need to be aware it's a tax. It's an overhead that you're paying all the time. Great. So the way caches work is they exploit a property known as locality. And there's two kinds. Locality in space is this idea that if I've used something, I'm probably going to use the thing next to it, or at least very close to it. And that's part of why we read a cache line. The other one is locality in time. If I've just used something, and I think about what am I most likely going to use again, it's something I've just used. Okay, I'm going to reuse it. And so these caches are built under the idea that we're going to read all the bytes in the cache line, and we're going to use that cache line for multiple reads in a short period of time. Now, there's a catch. And the catch is that these caches were designed to accelerate big math programs, high performance computing. And what do we do in that? Well, what we do is things like matrix multiplication. And those algorithms are also tuned in order to make the maximum use of cache. And if we're not that kind of program, the cache isn't going to work as well for us. Okay. Caching is most effective if we actually use the whole cache line. Right? And caching is most effective if we process the memory in sequential order. Okay, I say in a predictable pattern, but the reality has shown us that the only predictable pattern is sequential access. Right? So we want to keep things together and go through them sequentially. I'm going to drill down so the next slide is a little bit repetitive, but I want to look at this again in just a teeny weeny bit more detail. What makes a cache less efficient? All right? Well, the synchronization cost I've mentioned. Right? The cost of moving chunks of memory around, okay? And an example is a program I worked on where we got a 4K block coming in off the network, and an early version of the program actually copied that 4K block a couple times to different places in the process of serializing some things to send them out to another processor. Okay, Removing those extra copies made a 30% improvement on the workflow because those copies, these copying a big chunk of data from one place to another is can be very expensive. And the third one is the non-sequential access patterns. Right? If it's code, it's about function calls. And if it's data, it's more than anything about chasing pointers. Okay? However, I will say that a little bit of copying is better than going chasing pointers to go find things. And we'll get into that. Okay? What makes it more efficient, what makes the cache more efficient, is the opposite. Right? If we not only keep the code and the data in cache longer, and we use it all, okay, which means we've kept the data together, less spread out, and processing in sequential order. So I'm going to illustrate that. Here's an illustration. Okay, If we have a slice of data where the data is bodily in these elements of the slice or an array, either one, okay, they're contiguous in memory. And we go down the list sequentially. That is more efficient than, say, a linked list that uses pointers. 
All right. Now, at this point, you're going to say, well, boy, Matt, that's theoretical. And I'm going to say, no. I'm in the next segment on benchmarking, I'm going to show you benchmarks. And you may come back and say, well, the benchmarks are trivial. Well, so here's the thing. The benchmarks are designed to illustrate a concept that I have found in practice in real, large, high-scale, high-performance programs under real workloads. Okay, what I'm showing on the slide is not theory, and what I'm showing on the slide is not the, the product of a little benchmark. The little benchmark is an attempt to illustrate why this behavior does what it does, and it's going to do that in real programs. Okay, here's another example similar. It's better to have a bunch of data inside a struct, again, contiguous. So it's not just that I have fields, I have fields with data, and they're all contiguous. They're together in memory. Okay? That's better than having an object with a bunch of pointers to other objects because of the cost of the pointer chasing. And we're going to see this. The third illustration, which is likely to be the most controversial, has to do with the call cost of short method calls. Okay? And in particular, a disease I will call forwarding methods. And that's a case where a method doesn't do anything except call another method on another object, which calls another method on another object, to eventually do some work, basically by passing the buck. Now, I will say that I think that's a bad design. It's a design smell. It's caused by having too many layers of unnecessary abstractions. And that's one of those things that's crept into programming since the mid-90s. Right. There's an example of a web page I went to and it didn't work, and instead of giving me a useful error, it gave me a 70 method traceback. And when I looked at the names of the methods, they were all very similar, which led me to believe, and this is almost certainly the case, that this giant web framework has lots of forwarding methods. They're expensive, because I have to go out and get the pointer to the object and the pointer to the V table that has the pointer to the method to finally get a method I can execute on the object. And then I do it again, and then I do it again. And if I do that several times in a row, and then I get to the end, and I finally get a method that does real work, and it does maybe a couple of additions, or it gets a field out of a piece of data and returns it. Okay, what I've done is take that little piece of work and magnify it into something that's a hundred times more expensive because of all these extra dynamically dispatched method calls. Right? I mean, regular functions have overhead. Short functions have overhead. Okay. Method calls, because they're dynamically dispatched, have even more overhead. Right? So we need to avoid having forwarding methods that don't really do anything, which means we need to avoid unnecessary layers of abstraction. And really, we ought to avoid short method calls. And I'm flying in the face of a bunch of smart people who will tell you, write these two or three line methods. And I'm going to say, generally speaking, that's not a good idea. Okay. Um, by breaking up the program into lots of very short methods, it actually becomes harder to read the program. It's easier to think about an individual method. It's harder, though, to go and actually study the logic of the program, particularly when these methods are spread all over a very complicated abstraction that's more complicated than it needs to be. But from a performance perspective, it's awful. The cost of calling a very short method okay, is disproportionate to the work it does, particularly if all it does is call another method. Again, I will show this in a benchmark. Now, there's one other cost, and that is synchronization. And it's obvious if we have a mutex, we expect it to cost something to lock and unlock it. And there's a possibility that if a lot of Go routines in a program are trying to hit the same mutex, we're going to get a hotspot, right? And we actually said this in as many words when we were talking about concurrency, right? A race condition is a problem. We solve it with mutual exclusion. But mutual, mutual exclusion is actually about reducing the concurrency of the program. Okay? There's a related problem that happens because of the cache design. Right? It's not really a problem in the program in the sense of having a mutex. It's a problem that comes out of not thinking about where data is and having it end up in the wrong place in the cache. And the term is called false sharing. Okay? So what I've got here in this diagram I'm just showing two cores, right? We have a shared cache, and out here, presumably, we have some memory, right? And we have a couple of cache lines with different variables outlined in red, okay? So just think a different pointer or integer. There's no race condition between these two red variables. They are independent red var variables, okay? They may not need a mutex 
in the program. But a weird thing happens if they end up on the same cache line and they're heavily used. Okay, And that's because we can't have two cores writing to the same cache line at the same time. That's a race condition. And the hardware deals with it by transferring the cache line and ownership of the cache line. But what actually happens then is it bounces back and forth. Right? One processor writes it. It has to come out here at least to level 3 cache or maybe memory, come back and get rid into the other one who changes it and writes it back out and writes it back in. Now, there are a couple of processors that can short circuit this maybe between le level 2 cache or something. But what happens is the cache line, not just the logical ownership, but the cache line physically in a sense, bounces back and forth between the two cores. And that can drastically reduce performance. And it happens if a couple of heavily used variables happen to line up on the same cache line, even though they're unrelated and they're not a race condition between the variables. They may not even have mutexes. Again, that's not the issue. The issue is the behavior of the cache. Okay. We'll show a benchmark about this and talk about a way to solve it. Now, there are other costs that can happen out there. Okay. I've outlined a few, and they're generally not things you can control all that much. You know, in a disk file, maybe we can try to access the disk file sequentially, but the reality is we don't have a lot of control about where the disk blocks are on the physical disk, right? So we've, off, we've put off some of those things to the operating system, and we don't really control it anymore. So the only thing we can control to some degree is garbage collection. I'm not going to drill down into this very deeply in this class, okay? But obviously, first of all, we can avoid creating garbage, or that is to say, we can reduce the rate of memory allocation. That's one of the biggest wins. We can actually improve the speed of collection by not having objects that have lots of pointers in them. Because that's one of the things that costs. When, when the garbage collection happens, it has to go find all the objects. And if they have pointers, it has to go through all those pointers and so on. And paradoxically, we may actually get better performance if we enlarge the heap. Although if you think about it, what I'm really saying is your server will have better latency and throughput if it uses more memory. So if we think about trading time and memory, well, we've been doing that for 70 years. And so that's actually not that surprising. OK, so I just want to finish with a few thoughts about optimization. First, how does this relate to Go? Well, the nice thing about Go is it gives you lots of choices and allows you to actually do mechanical sympathy, in a sense, because it doesn't get between you and the machine. Okay. The other idea is about not hiding costs. The Go language itself tries to avoid hiding the cost of operations from you. And good Go code that you write, ideally, will also not hide the costs from the people who read your code. We want to make the logic explicit, and we want to make the costs explicit, because that way we can see them and think about them. Now, there's a famous quote by Don Newth, and people remember the part here that's in bold. I want to show the whole quote in context, because it gets at something else I was saying. Yes, we do want to optimize, although usually it's better to build a program, make it work, and then go figure out where the pain points are and solve them. Okay? But we're trading off the cost of fixing some of those pain points against the cost of micro-optimizing stuff that doesn't really need it and creating code that's hard to maintain. And this is, again, not a new phenomenon. It's been going on for a long time. There are lots of clever people who want to do really clever things, which may not have a lot of cost-benefit in performance, but may have a whole real problem with cost-benefit when you consider what they do to the cost of debugging and maintaining the program. Right? So we want to use some common sense. And the last thought I want to bring you is to bring this back around to this notion of go top-down. Again, we've been talking about mechanical sympathy. That happens at the implementation level. It's about doing things faster. But this good quote reminds us that sometimes the best thing is just not doing it at all. Okay. So that, again, helps put into context what we're doing when we're trying to make the performance better. So that's my very short introduction to mechanical sympathy. Right? I talked a little bit about the hardware, and I talked about some things in programs that make less efficient use of the memory hierarchy. And we're going to get into benchmarking, and we're actually going to see this in the benchmark programs when they run. It'll be very clear.